听众、观众朋友们，大家好，欢迎您收听、收看本期《时事大家谈》，我是乔战。美国 p o 研究中心四月二十一日发布民调数据显示，约有三分之二的受访美国民众对中国持有负面看法。这一数据是该机构自二零零五年开始向受访者询问有关对中国的看法这一问题以来的最高值。两年前，这项数据还是百分之四十七。为何美国民众在短时间内对中国的看法发生了这样的变化？这种趋势在疫情结束之后是否仍将持续？长远看来，美中关系将走向何方？本期《时事大家谈》，我们为您邀请到美国前驻华大使瑞孝简。我们现在就来听一听瑞孝简大使的看法。As you know, about two-thirds of Americans now hold negative views of China, according to a new poll conducted by the Pew Research. Just two years ago, the number was 47 percent. So, from 47 percent to nearly 67 percent, why is there a steep change in public opinions in a in a short term?、Uh, I do not find these changes surprising, because ever since this administration、uh, took office, it is defined in its national strategy documents、uh, the view that China. Is our principal rival in the world, militarily and economically, and in some sense, in ideologically as well. Authoritarian systems of governance versus democratic systems of governance.、Uh, so that this has been the overall framework with whom which this administration is looking at China. But we also have uh, uh, the trade war against China. Which has highlighted the view that we lost manufacturing jobs to China, and that China has been treating with us so badly on economic issues, theft of intellectual property,、uh, barriers to our investment, that we were justified to put up trade barriers against China. So that has created a negative attitude toward China, and now we have the administration trying to shift blame to China. For the fact that we now have a coronavirus epidemic in the United States, which many Americans believe was principally the responsibility of the administration, not of China, but the administration is trying to say that China withheld information, did not cooperate with the World Health Organization, and so we have become very critical of China there,、um, uh, from this standpoint. So the fact that we have had a negative shift in sentiments here toward China. I do not find surprising. Do you think this trend will continue even after this pandemic? I don't think that the worsening of attitudes will continue necessarily.、Uh, the,、uh, but I think the problem in U.S.-China relations、uh, of negative perceptions on both sides、uh, is likely to continue. What is needed is a Relook at the U.S.-China relationship, and in my judgment, it should be put on a sounder basis.、Uh, I've worked with China for many, many years,、uh, going back to when we were actually were hostile countries toward each other、uh, in the wake of the Korean War, and through the improvement of our relations with the establishment of diplomatic relations in 1979.、Uh, And I became ambassador in China two years after the Tiananmen affair in、uh, 1989, so that I have seen great swings in public attitudes toward China.、Uh, I think that the current trend reflects two things. First, the United States did become the sole superpower because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. It wasn't our policy to become a sole superpower. We were surprised when the Soviet Union collapsed, but it left us in this unchallenged position.、Uh, and this shortly was followed by China's rapid economic rise, and then the 2008 global financial crisis, which created a global impression that the United States and Europe were both in decline. So China caught up with the United States much more rapidly than most people had anticipated. So the United States has been dealing with two factors:、uh, one, 
is that uh, our economy ran into difficulties and we've struggled with budget deficits right up to the present moment when the budget deficit has gone through the ceiling. And secondly, China's rapid rise has enabled it to modernize its military much more rapidly than expected. The third factor is China has shown all of the characteristics of a rising country. It has become arrogant. It has become self-confident. Uh, it's defining its goals in terms of becoming a major power in the world by the middle of the century. It's claiming that it needs to have a global military capability that is second to none. This was stated in the 19th Party Congress. But there is no reason why China, if its intentions are defensive, needs a global military power capability. So in other words, China is defining its power requirements in terms of its status as a great nation rather than in terms of its defense needs. So this creates a security dilemma for all of China's uh, uh, neighbors and also for the United States. So the United States has not handled these challenges well in my judgment. Psychologically, we have gone on the defensive and China is seen as the principal cause for our growing concern about our uh, security status vis-a-vis -vis China and about our economic capabilities vis-a-vis -vis China. And this is reflected in some of the negative attitudes that are welling up. In addition, there has been a reinterpretation of our approach to China, which in my opinion is fundamentally wrong, which is the, the idea of engagement with China is the root of our problems, that we were unrealistic and naive in dealing with China, and that now we are more realistic in seeing that China is a threat and that therefore we have to deal with this threat uh, as our number one priority. So this is the background for these negative images of China. Uh, China has been contributing to it it's, itself, as I mentioned, because ever since the global financial crisis, so this predates Xi Jinping, China has been throwing its weight around, threatening smaller labors, acting in ways that China historically has said it would never act that way. But in fact, it is acting that way. Chinese are proud of the fact that they now have prosperity and power that they didn't dream possible uh, a few decades ago. And so the question is, how should we be dealing with this? And in my judgment, we ought to have a better understanding. Being a sole superpower was not a good thing. It was a bad thing because American political theory says that unchecked power will be abused. And so with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States had unchecked power and we have abused it. We went into an unnecessary war in Iraq. We've been bogged down in the longest war in our history in Afghanistan. Uh, all of these things wouldn't have happened this way if there had been some opposing power checking us. But we don't necessarily want to create an opposing power to check us. In my judgment, the mistake that we made was that we should have strengthened international institutions and then put ourselves under the discipline of operating in consistency with the ground rules that have been established for international behavior. But in fact, that we did exactly the opposite. When we became the sole superpower, we gave less attention to having strong international institutions. And as we saw in the case of Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, we operated outside of the UN uh, in taking military actions. So that uh, these are the factors that have created the current situation. I think that with good leadership on both sides, we can actually put the relationship on a more stable basis in which the elements of rivalry will always be present, but there will be a better understanding of how important it is for China and the United States to work together to deal with global issues that only can be addressed properly if China and the United States are cooperating. And that element in our relationship is missing at the present time. I noticed there's some stories I read this morning. Ambassador Cui Tian Kai, the Chinese ambassador in the United States, 
is calling for a rethinking of the bilateral relationship. And I actually, uh, I myself, have independently come to the same conclusion, that that's exactly what we need. China's behavior in Xinjiang, the way it has handled the riots in uh, Hong Kong, uh, and the fact that it did not um, provide as quickly as possible uh, information about the emergence of the um, coronavirus. All these are actions in which you could say China has contributed to having a negative international image. And so I think that this is, this is not a question of just the United States that need, needs to do better. I think we both need to do better. How do you describe the U.S.-China relations in the long term? I have seen our relations with China go from very negative to much more positive. And I think that it is quite possible for China and the United States to have a stable relationship in which we respect each other's fundamental interests and try to manage areas of cooperation so that they are more dominant than areas of rivalry between us. But that requires strong leadership at the top. And uh, I, I think that's where we need to do a uh, better job. Uh, we, we cannot avoid the rivalry elements. It's inherent in the nature of having two countries, especially one that is rising rapidly and one that has been stable in its position as the um, as the strongest power in the world. Uh, I think it would be the wrong policy for the United States to spend all of our time trying to maintain a position of dominance. That is not a good thing. Much better to have a stable international order in which the strongest countries in the world, and it won't just be China and the United States. We have Japan, we have India, we have Europe. Uh, there are a lot of powerful things. This idea of a unipolar world uh, is not a stable concept, uh, and it's not even a good concept. Uh, but on the other hand, history shows that maintaining balances of power is difficult. And if you don't have the, good, the right leaders to do it, uh, it becomes impossible. So this is a real challenge we are facing, uh, and I do not consider it a challenge that we cannot meet. Some people believe that the United States and China might govern the world together in the future, but some other people argue that yi shan bu rong er hu. Do you think the United States will be willing to govern the world together with China? Uh, that's the so-called G2 concept. Uh, and I do not agree with it. Uh, I think that the United States and China may very well be the strongest countries in the world for some period of time uh, in terms of our military power and in terms of our economic power. But I think that focusing on a so-called G2 is the wrong way to look at it because Japan is a very powerful economic country uh, Europe is a very powerful economic entity. Uh, Brazil and South America is the dominant country uh, in that part of the world. I think that to talk about we too running the world makes no sense. Uh, it requires cooperation between China and the United States to deal with many global issues. But for example, if we begin to address the issue of global warming, properly through cooperation, we still have to bring India into that cooperation process. Because at the moment, the, pollu the air pollution in India is now worse than it is in China. And so you can't deal with that sort of problem, which is related to global warming, unless you have India as part of the uh, uh, connection. Uh, if, we, if the United States and China begin to talk as though we have some right or responsibility to rule the world between us, I can guarantee you that will be opposed by Europe, by India, by Japan, by Brazil, by Turkey, by other major regional powers, and you will not have a stable international order. So what I look for is I think the United States and China have the principal responsibility to demonstrate that we can cooperate with each other 
And then we should look for the same pattern of cooperation from the other major powers. But to put it in terms of we too can be the principal players in terms of setting the rules for the international order, that in my is a is a、um, recipe for failure. 听众观众朋友们，您刚才听到的是美国前驻华大使瑞孝简就美中关系等话题发表的看法。嘉宾在节目中发表的观点仅代表嘉宾本人，不代表美国之音。感谢您的收听收看，我们下期再见。